Let's look at an oversized katana. Hi folks, Matt Eaton here, Scholar Gladiatoria. Now this is a Dynasty Forge Bushi class O Katana. It's the Silver Wave version, okay? And there's a link below uh, this video in the description to this specific sword, but also uh, you can see on um, Dynasty Forge's website that they offer a whole range of different Katanas, O Katanas, Wakazashis, Tantos, and so on. Now, this is a sword that I've actually had for quite a while, and uh, first up, I have to apologize that I haven't reviewed this sooner. It's actually featured in a lot of uh, videos already, uh, not cutting with it, but just generally talking about Japanese swords. Um, there are a number of reasons why I haven't got around to reviewing this previously, uh, but hopefully this will make, uh, make amends for that. Now this is going to be part review, but also part talking about the fact that this is an O katana or big katana, large katana. Um, now there's going to be a little bit of a historical context, there's going to be a talking a little bit about what that means uh, in real terms, having a katana that's bigger than an average katana. Um, and also talking a little bit about this specific replica of an Okatana. So first up, what is an Okatana? Well, many of you who are familiar with the history of Japanese swords will know that the Katana is a type of sword that came out of the Ucha Katana in the 15th century by uh, Western measuring of time. So um, prior to that, the primary so-called samurai sword, or the kind of knightly sword as it were, um, was the Tachi. Okay, now the Tachi has some different characteristics to the Katana. Um, and the, in some ways we could make some parallels with Chinese swords and the Jian and the uh, Dao but I'm not going to go into that here. Uh, but essentially the um, Tachi started to be uh, replaced in popularity by the uh, samurai classes in the 15th century and particularly in the 16th century. Now that's not to say that there was a straight switch over. Uh, the Tachi in fact continued to be used right the way through to the 20th century uh, in certain contexts and they were still being made. Uh, but the katana became the most popular type of sword. Now in terms of the differences between the Tachi and the Katana, I, as I have promised, I will do a video about that in the future. It's actually not a simple subject, um, but it's, not, it's also not as complicated as some people make it out to be. Uh, but essentially, there are tendencies um, in difference between the two in blade shape, uh, and importantly in the fittings of the um, suka and the whole hilt, essentially, and also the way they're worn. Now, if you're looking at uh, a Japanese sword, and from a sort of layman's point of view, you want to know, is that a tachi or is that a katana? The simple way is to look at how it's worn. Um, and that is, you'll notice that you've got sagio here, and the katana is worn through the obi, or sash, um, with the edge upwards, okay? Whereas the old tachi was worn edge downwards uh, from slings, much more like a European saber, for example. As I said, there are also differences in the uh, style of the hilt fittings and um, the, even the shape of the blade and the shape of the uh, tang as well, nakago, um, but we'll go into those in further detail in another video. The important thing to uh, kind of recognize is that the tachi very often was larger than the katana, not always, and there, uh, there were tachi that were cut down and became katana, okay, so um, thereby dispel dispelling the idea that a, uh, a tachi blade is completely different from a katana blade, because in fact we see tachi blades mounted up as katana and shortened down to be made into katana. Um, but the, in the age of the tachi, so if we're talking about between the uh, around 1000 AD all the way through to the 1400s um, AD, um, you will find that the blades very often are longer than katana blades tended to be in the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries. So, the style or the size of sword that people are used to encountering uh, in a katana replica is the size of a typical, in fact, it tends to be even slightly longer, um, but the size of a, a slightly long typical uh, katana of the 16th to 19th centuries, okay, so they're basically the late Muromachi and the Edo period, for example. Um, whereas if we go earlier into, into the Kamakura and uh, other periods before the 15th century, then swords tended to be bigger. But, you might be saying that, but this isn't Okatana, why are you talking about Tachi? Well, there was a strange situation in uh, Japanese sword development whereby 
Um, the Tachi was, generally speaking, a longer sword um, and was often accompanied by a tanto, so a, a dagger, essentially, a bit like a long sword and dagger in medieval Europe. But then in the 15th century, there came to be a fashion for wearing the katana, which was, generally speaking, shorter than the Tachi, uh, being worn in the sash edge up with a wakasashi, which is bigger than a tanto. <laughs> um, so they kind of went from having a really long sword and a dagger to having a shorter sword and kind of a bigger dagger or a short, a short sword, another short sword, but shorter than the katana. So a strange kind of situation, but if we go back into the age of the Tachi, okay, before the 15th century, then we do occasionally see very large versions of the Tachi. And this survived in the 14th and 15th centuries, occasionally in what's commonly these days known as a Nodashi, although I understand it's more correctly known as an Odashi, which just mean, simply means O-Tachi, okay? It means a, a, a big sword. Now, you might be saying, well, isn't that what you just said an O-Katana is? And yes, indeed. But bear in mind that the O-Tachi is a big Tachi and the O katana is a big katana. So in both periods, there was a uh, there was the tachi period and the katana period. There were big versions of those swords, and it's interesting that they kind of went from having tachi to having shorter swords, the katana, and then but still decided some people still wanted a big version of it. So it's a bit like in the West, the fact that we've got um, long swords, a typical bastard sword or hand and a half sword that most people were happy with and made a good battlefield weapon, but then there were some people who wanted a bigger two-handed sword, something that's almost too practical to wear around, but they kind of thought, well, I want a really big sword. And that drive and that desire existed in Japan, in the age of the Tachi, and in the age of the Katana. In other words, we get a sort of convergent evolution in the same place, in different periods, whereby you get a big version of the Tachi, but you also get a big version of the Katana, and that's what the O Katana is. So the first thing that strikes you when uh, drawing this Okatana is that it is big. It's bigger, therefore it's heavier. It feels very, very different in the hand. That's also partly to do with the uh, manufacturer and tendencies as well. I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. Um, but if we just compare it for a second to a more typically sized um, katana. Um, so this katana has around a 28 inch blade and you'll notice that the O katana is notably longer and broader in this case as well. Um, and this one, the O katana, in this case now if you look on the Dynasty Forge website they actually say it has a 32 inch blade. There is always some confusion <laughs> when me measuring the uh, nagasa or length of um, Japanese sword blades because, of course, it's usually measured the cutting edge down to the habaki, which is this uh, brass fitting at the base here, which traditionally would usually be copper or silver or something else, but modern ones tend to be brass. Um, and they usually measure the cutting edge down to there, but in terms of other swords, if we're talking about European swords or Indian swords or Chinese swords, we usually measure the blade length as whatever's in front of the handguard because that's your reach. So you add on about an extra inch uh, because of the length of the habaki here. So it's a little bit confusing <laughs> because you end up therefore on paper with, okay, if Dynasty Forge say this is the 32 inch blade, you add on an inch, you've actually got 33 inches of reach. And that's kind of the reality here. What I would note is that uh, the length of this is actually slightly different to what they say on the website. Um, and so if I just, just grab a tape measure here, if I actually measure down to the uh, habaki, it's actually only 31 and a half inches, but measured down to the uh, suba or guard, it's actually 32 and a half inches in a straight line. Um, so, uh, there we go. The, the total length is 32 and a half. The length of the cutting edge is 31 and a half, both of which are slightly different to what they say on the website. But anyway, it gives you a general idea. Now, you will notice, therefore, that it is a considerably bigger sword. Now, in my um, life prior to having this O Katana, I have actually handled quite a lot of antique uh, Japanese swords, but I have always been clear to mention I'm not a Japanese sword expert, but I'm trying to learn more. Um, now, in my earlier life of antique dealing and collecting um, and working in auction houses and antique shops and things like this, I have handled a number of antique stores and I have had the pleasure to hold a 16th century 
um, what I guess would have been a no katana in hindsight. They actually had it labeled as a no dashi, but in hindsight it was a 16th century blade. So it's probably it would be more correctly classed as no katana. Now that was very long, okay, and that was comparable uh, to uh, something like this, okay. So it was pretty much up to the sternum, um, and very very interesting sword, uh, but of course a very different type of weapon to a standard sized katana. You can't uh, wear it and draw it. You can't do any ei or stuff like that. Well, at least not standard ei uh, with a blade of that length. With the Dynasty Forge Okatana, um, you, you would be able to do more techniques and more repertoire that is more similar to the standard use of a katana, but the katana handles very, very differently and feels very differently. And to anyone who's accustomed to swords from outside of Japan, pretty much everyone in the world tended to have an average blade length, uh, certainly in this period, that was longer than Japanese swords. So Japanese swords are at least the blade, obviously they've got long hilts, but the blade is relatively short. Most katana from the 16th century are between kind of 24 and 28 inches um, in, in length, which by compared to Indian swords or uh, European swords or even Chinese swords is relatively short. When you get an Okatana, that actually makes a sword which is now more comparable with swords from uh, Europe, or Renaissance Europe, or indeed um, India or anywhere else. So in fact, when we get to a sword of this size, it creates a very, very different type of sword, very different type of handling. Now, funnily enough, obviously I come from a European swordsmanship background. I've done a little bit of Japanese and a little bit of Chinese stuff, but uh, primarily European swordsmanship. And coming from that European swordsmanship background, as soon as I got my hands on this Okatana, it felt more like swords I was familiar with because it's got a blade length, which is more similar to many types of um, arming sword and bastard sword and saber, lots of European, you know, but even back swords, all sorts of European swords have a blade length of about this. Uh, but equally, it's configured with a long hilt and it's a fairly thick blade. I've spoken about this in the past. Japanese swords are pretty thick um, compared. They're fairly narrow, actually, it has to be said. They're as narrow as a European uh, back sword or saber, which for the periods uh, that they were originally devised in, um, so if we go back all the way to the kind of 10th, 11th century, then this is a fairly narrow blade compared to most other swords in the world at that time, but it is a thick blade, so they distribute the, the steel in a, in a different way to most other places. Um, but this handles far more like certain types of European longsword, uh, type 12, type 13, uh, relatively early longswords, so it kind of feels more familiar. And yes, indeed, it handles quite like, I don't have it hanging up there anymore, uh, but it handles quite like European Mesa. Uh, and uh, connected to the European Lang Mesa is the um, kind of early forms of saber as well. And the famous Swiss saber, of which is a famous example in the Wallace collection. So yes, indeed, when you get into the Okatana size, it does handle more like weapons that we're familiar with from European swordsmanship. And indeed, it handles uh, more similarly to certain Indian swords as well. Now, while I've explained that the size of the Okatana and therefore also the kind of weight and everything else of it, feels more familiar to European longswords and certain other swords that people from outside of Japanese swordsmanship might be familiar with. For people inside Japanese swordsmanship, I imagine that a sword of this size, weight, proportions is going to be somewhat of a struggle for certain traditional repertoire, um, particularly if your focus is on EI, for example. Now, ironically, if your focus is on kendo, uh, then obviously a kendo shinai is very uh, light, and we used to use kendo shinai, in fact, in the early days of Hima, so I'm very familiar with uh, the use of them. But uh, kendo shinai are very light, but they are also quite long. Uh, kendo shinai are much longer than most katana are, and they're actually more similar to kind of like the length of a long tachi, I suppose, um, and therefore similar to the length of an okatana. Um, but they are very light and this is fairly weighty. Um, but if you're familiar with EI, then you are going to find, unless you're particularly uh, tall, I suppose, you are going to find the length of this somewhat of a problem because if this is being worn in the traditional position, the traditional angles, you're going to have to change certain things in order to get this blade out easily because, of course, you've now got, if most people are training with maybe a, a 27, 28-inch blade, maybe some people 29-inch blade, but this is 
essentially 32, 33 inches. So you really got a lot of blade to be able to get out and um, do your techniques with. So undoubtedly there will have to be changes made in how you use this because of its size. That being said, it's not massive. It's not like the Nodashi that most people are familiar with uh, from things like Seven Samurai or indeed from uh, modern replicas. Um, it's not so massive that you can't wear it. Um, so it is like it, it is like wearing a large katana, and which is what it is. It isn't a whole separate weapon type. Now, a very brief interjection. How do I feel about this sword? Well, I have to say, I made a video when I first got this sword, actually, and I intended to do the review soon after and, and never got around to it because other things got in the way. But I was really surprised by how differently an O katana would make me feel to a typical katana. Not to say I don't like katanas, uh, but I'm more drawn towards Tachi, I'm more drawn towards the slightly longer ones. And you have to bear in mind that the size of most replica katanas are based on antique katanas, and antique katanas were made for antique Japanese people. And it has to be just admitted straight up that Japanese people in the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries were considerably shorter than me. So I'm about one meter 84, about six foot one, or just slightly under. Um, so for me, a typical Japanese katana length is a, a pretty short sword, and it feels very short compared to other swords I'm used to. And if we look at Chinese sword history um, and the development of the Miao Dao, for example, and earlier versions of it, the large Dao, they actually refer <laughs> in quite derogatory terms to Japanese pirates they were fighting against at the time when they're developing these swords and Chinese swords, it has to be uh, admitted straight up, were influenced by Japanese swords in this period. There was a back and forth. Originally, Japanese swords were based on Chinese swords and then later on, Chinese swords were influenced by Japanese swords. Um, but they actually refer to the Japanese pirates as dwarfs. <laughs> um, and obviously this is not a politically correct term, and it's not something that they, they use in, in, in modern times. But the Chinese of that period, we're talking 15th, 16th century, 17th century as well, considered the Japanese short, okay? Um, so the fact is we have to admit that the Japanese sword, although it's fairly large for Japanese people of that time, is fairly small for us. This, however, is more sized, I suppose, in proportion to me to what a typical katana would be sized to a typical Japanese person of that time. So in many ways, what the O katana feels like to me might be what a typical katana felt like to a 16th or 17th century Japanese person. Therefore, I found it a really big eye-opener to have a giant katana, O katana, of this size because it gave me a very different impression of what the katana was as a weapon and how it functioned. Because, of course, we got to remember that the size size of a weapon is relative to the size of the person and therefore I get a very different feeling and experience from this weapon than I do from a uh, standard sized katana which feels kind of a bit too small for me. So let's talk a little bit about this particular reproduction from Dynasty Forge, the Silver Wave. Again, link below to this particular model. There are variations of it as well as other katanas and stuff that you can find on the Linity Forge website. Um, so, I'll talk a little bit about the fixtures, the fittings, the quality, all of that kind of stuff in a minute. Um, but um, first of all, just some basic stats. So I've already talked about the blade length. It is uh, just under 33 inches in terms of total reach if we come down to the guard, so including the habaki, okay? The weight or mass is 1,225 grams. So considerably heavier than your average katana, but not especially heavy. And in fact, generally speaking, lighter than most uh, European longswords of this size, although they tend to be a little bit longer. Um, but it's not a particularly heavy sword. But what I will say is, despite the fact it's 1,225 grams, it doesn't feel light because it's not a very nimble sword. The point of balance is quite far from the hand, certainly by Western standards. But that is, I think, correct compared to most antique katana that I've handled and indeed the majority of replicas. Now, 
Distal taper, we'll, talk, we'll look at distal taper in a minute, but distal taper varies a lot in Japanese swords. And when people look at a Japanese sword blade, you can't necessarily tell the distal taper, so you can't necessarily make assumptions about how that sword will handle because they all tend to follow similar range of silhouettes. But they can vary quite a lot in the taper in this plane uh, in terms of the thickness of the blade and how it reduces or doesn't in some cases. Now, so therefore, with that point of balance being that far from the hand and having a relatively uh, beefy blade up there and a fairly thick uh, kisaki or tip, it does mean that this has a lot of momentum to it. This, you can probably hear it makes with the bohi or fuller, um, you get quite a nice swish out of it, um, but it has a lot of momentum. Once you start this thing moving, it has a lot of force in the tip of the blade. Um, uh, so, but that has a flip side effect in that it's quite uh, it takes quite a lot of inertia to change or quite a lot of energy rather to change the direction of the inertia back to the uh, basic stats of the sword so uh, the um, steel used this is actually the forge folded version uh, it, obviously it's differentially um, hardened so you've got a ham on a real ham on on there and you can see, uh, can see some activity in the Hada because it's forge folded, okay? And the three steels uh, used are apparently 1095, 1080, and 1060. Um, so it's essentially a laminated steel with a differentially hardened blade of close to 60 Rockwell on the edge and something lower on the back, probably about 45 on the back. Now onto the fixtures and fitting. So first thing I'll talk about, I think, is the um, uh, grip or suka, um, and that has got um, Samagawa, um, which is ray skin underneath, which is genuine ray skin. It's got uh, a cotton, I believe, Ito over the top. Um, now the ray skin appears, it's fairly large noduled, fairly, uh, fairly nice, size nodules in there. The diamonds of the Ito are fairly um, fair size. They're not particularly small, they're not particularly large, um, and they're fairly regular. So something you want to look for on a nice quality uh, Ito wrap is that the diamond uh, apertures here, where you can see the Samagawa through there, are of roughly, well, they should be precisely equal size, in fact. And these are pretty good. They're not uh, amazing. You can see, for example, that one's smaller, that one's bigger, that one's bigger still. So they do vary a bit, but they're not, you know, they're, they're not wildly out there. The other thing you really want, uh, particularly for using it, doesn't matter if you're going to hang it on the wall, of course, but if you're using it, is that the Ito is tight. Okay, that is tightly wrapped. Now, one way of testing that is just um, as my friend Matthew Jensen, uh, so go and check out his channel incidentally, he does a lot of Japanese swords. Um, and something I've learned from Matthew Jensen is he always pushes the uh, wrap around. Now, that's useful because whilst I've had some Japanese swords through my collection over the years, I haven't had anything like the number of Japanese swords that Matthew Jensen has had. So um, it's useful for me watching his videos, seeing makes that he's looked at that I haven't yet um, and seeing how what they are like is a comparative thing so I get a sense of relativity here um, and my impression is that the Dynasty Forge wrap is quite tight it's not the tightest uh, it's certainly not bad but it's not amazing either you can move those um, you can move those around probably more than you'd really want to but it's relatively tight in terms of the uh, grip shape, I really, really like it. Okay, so some katanas can tend to have a bit of a round shape, and as you know, it's good for indexing a weapon's edge alignment, although that's not so much of a problem with a curved blade, but nevertheless, it always helps. Uh, if you've got a flatter grip, than, uh, so if it's flatter in this plane, in the planes of the cutting edge, than uh, in this way. So <clears throat> this is uh, really quite a flat grip, and I like that. And because it's a fairly large, a uh, fairly large blade and therefore a fairly large uh, Nakago or Tang, um, it's, um, you could end up with an overly fat uh, grip and that is potentially a problem with Japanese style swords because they have such a thick Tang, you've got to make the grip uh, fit around that Tang but you don't want to make the grip overly large in your hand. And I actually, as you know, probably if you watch many of my videos, I tend to prefer smaller grips, despite the fact that I'm not small and I don't have small hands. I've got, in fact, kind of large-ish hands, long hands, certainly. 
I actually like quite small grips and so this grip is nice it's it's pretty much a perfect size if you notice if I'm gripping it there my fingers don't go they don't sort of clash with the base of my thumb they, they it's great yeah I have no no criticism of the shape or size of that grip at all I'll just put this back into the um, Saya just because it's easier to handle that way. <coughs> right, so in terms of the uh, grip fittings, we've got the two main ones at the uh, top or bottom, depending what you want to call it. We've essentially got the pommel end, um, which is the Kashira, and then we've got the Fuchi down here, which now, what's the Fuchi for, in, in case you've ever wondered? We also find uh, ferrules such as that, they'd be called in Europe on lots of uh, European, and you find it on Chinese swords as well, it's essentially to stop the grip splitting, okay? There's a lot of pressure here um, where the tang goes into the wooden grip under here. Uh, and incidentally, that's one of the reasons for the um, Samagawa or shark skin, is the shark skin is uh, waterproof, okay? It's also a grippy, gives a good um, kind of uh, texture. It's also incredibly strong. Uh, and it holds together the wood. Now, if you've ever wondered why bare wooden grips aren't used very much on swords and knives, it's because wood can split. But if you wrap it in something like Samagawa or leather or whatever, or cord, then it prevents the grip from splitting. Uh, even, usually, I think, it even prevents it from, or it's, impedes its ability to split inside that wrapping as well. It just has a good holding the fibers of the wood together kind of effect. Okay, so uh, that's what the Fuchi's for. Now they are decorated um, and they are cast. So they're cast um, brass, I would say, uh, but they're colored to look bronzy. It's some type of alloy, I don't know which. Um, one thing I would say is these little fittings, I don't know what they're called, where the um, uh, where the Ito goes through, sorry, not focused there, where the Ito goes through the Kashira there, they are on replicas often cast as one piece with the Kashira, in other words, the kind of butt cap, if we want to call it that. Um, and in this case, they are separate pieces, which is a nice detail, I think, because the original ones tend to be separate pieces. In terms of, uh, and we've seen this with the recent sword I've reviewed, um, so Japanese swords often have a problem of the Kashura coming, um, coming loose uh, because they tend to be, with Chinese made replicas, and I believe that Dynasty Forge are probably making these in China, um, are, they're glued on very often, okay? And the glue in transit and in changes of climate and everything else, the epoxy underneath comes loose. Now, I haven't, this does move a little bit. So I don't necessarily know if this is glued in place. It probably is. There's a tiny bit of movement in the um, uh, Kashira, so that's not great. Now, in terms of the texture of this, when I initially saw this, let's try and get the camera to focus, there we go. When I initially saw this, so th bear in mind, this is called the silver wave. So this is supposed to be waves, crashing waves. Um, when I saw this, I thought, wow, that's really good casting. Now, it's not bad casting, it's pretty good, okay? I think at this price point, I don't think we complain about the quality of that casting. One thing I would say though, looking at uh, original um, uh, koshirai or fittings for, for Japanese swords, which I have been doing recently, I've actually just thrown in here, I've recently purchased a couple of antique Japanese swords and I'll be talking about them in future videos. But looking at original antique fittings, one thing you tend not to get is something that's going to cause abrasion or discomfort on the hand. Now, m my one uh, criticism of these castings, and this is true of the Kashira, of the Fuchi, and indeed of the Suba, is that they are very nicely textured, and they look very nice, but they're not particularly ergonomic. Um, and I think that if someone was using this for regular uh, training, be it uh, EI or even if it's, uh, you know, a battered or, you know, um, cutting tatami mats or whatever, I suspect that someone's going to get very annoyed very quickly by how much texture is on there, particularly the Kashira. I don't think it's so much of a problem for the Fuchi and the Suba, uh, but particularly the Kashira, although it depends how you grip it. And I do understand that lots of people in Japanese swordsmanship are told not to grip the Kashira. And if you don't grip the Kashira, then the fact that it might come detached, the fact that it's got texture on it might not be so important. Personally, 
I personally find that my hand will want to interact doing various things with the edges and sides of that kashira because of the longsword tradition that I come from because Fiore uh, Delibri's longsword system definitely uh, does things with the back end of the sword uh, and the pommel which mean that I want that to be comfortable in my hand and I find that this is distinctly uncomfortable. The only thing I would kind of throw back on to play devil's advocate against that is to say that more texture might be uncomfortable but more texture also means you're less likely to lose your grip on the weapon. So just like I was saying about with the Samagawa or shark skin, if you have more texture, yeah, it might be rougher on your hands. Your hands will get rougher from using it, but it does mean that you're less likely to drop or, or you know, disarm yourself, basically, or be disarmed. Um, you shouldn't really be butting up your hand against the Suba, but if you do, it is quite rough. And if I did this for any amount of time, I'd wear a hole in my hand. So one thing to be wary about these very deep casting and textured uh, hilt fittings, Koshirai, is that whether it's the Suba, not so much of a problem, but if it's the Fuchi or the Kashura, then indeed, if they're rough, they will wear down your hands and they will hurt a bit. Just talking fairly briefly about the Habaki, it is a nice, thick brass Habaki, and it is very well fitted to the blade. There is a slight gap in there, you can see, but generally speaking, I would say compared to the vast majority of um, Habaki out there on Chinese replica, Japanese swords, um, it's pretty good. I would say disappointing that it's brass. They all, all these replica companies are using brass. It would look so much better and more original if it was copper or even if it was um, nickel plated so it was silver colored. But uh, brass habaki are just uh, quite boring and this is a boring habaki. That being said, it's reasonably well made, it's reasonably well fitted. The sepa are particularly uninspiring, I would say. They're just pretty much standard flat. They don't even quite look brass. They look a bit kind of, I don't know, silvery colored, but um, they are slightly, you know, they've got little indentations around the edges. They're just fairly basic, thin, boring uh, sepa. Um, sepa are essentially washers um, to make everything tight and uh, if you replace a hilt on a, a Japanese sword then you can introduce more sepa to block the, uh, to fill out uh, a user's washers and fill out the gap and make the grip tight. There are two um, Makugi um, pins and they are bamboo, look like chopsticks and one side of one of them is mashed. Traditionally uh, in most Japanese swords you only have one and the hilt is friction fitted onto the tang. So in theory, the uh, you would only need one uh, Makugi peg through, um, and in fact, even without that peg in, the tang should be pretty tight. Uh, sorry, the, the uh, suka should be pretty tight on the tang. Um, but with replicas, it's not always the case because they mass produce all the parts. They put them together, and so to make them more secure, they put two pegs through. So there we are. It is what it is. That's true of lots of modern replicas. Just so you know, it would be more historically correct to have one and to have that uh, friction fitted. I have not taken this hilt apart, incidentally. So I can't tell you anything about the tang, um, and uh, I can't tell you anything about how tightly fitted the suka is. Uh, one um, other thing, actually, I'll just talk about the manuki. So the manuki are these... Uh, ornaments essentially that sit underneath the Ito wrap and we've got one on one side there, one on one side there. Different companies place these differently. Some of them put them so they're in the palm of the hand. Uh, Dynasty Forge have put them so they're not in the palm of the hand for a right-handed person. If you're uh, left-handed they will be in the palm of your hand but for a right-handed person I have no uh, Manuki in my hand really. I can feel it on the end of my fingers and they're not really a problem. They, they're, they're not a hassle. I'm actually not a huge fan of Manuki. One thing I would say about these is that they are quite deep. Uh, they're quite, they stand quite proud of the grip. And I actually think they're kind of too bulky and too big. Not to say there aren't antique examples like that, there are. But generally speaking, I would say that these are a bit thicker than I would prefer. And if they were made flatter, you wouldn't notice them in the hand at all. And I think you'd, they'd still look cool. Um, but you wouldn't feel them and I kind of think that Manuki are a little bit decadent and a little bit um, they can get in, a bit in the way of your use of the weapon I find um, and I would prefer them if they were flatter or smaller so I just didn't feel them so much.
Now just briefly in terms of the Saya, um, it's a pretty much bog standard. It's fairly soft wood I have noticed uh, from uh, sheathing and unsheathing the uh, blade. I've noticed that the wood is really quite soft wood inside, softer than an average um, uh, than an average side that I'm familiar with. The other thing I have noticed as well is the top piece here. I've not been particularly aggressive with sheathing it, uh, but it has actually cracked the paint slightly, and that's because this top bit is a separate piece of wood, and when you sheath it, um, it uh, it has a join around it and at that point of the join the wood has cracked off and I think that might be partly to do with the softness of the wood uh, because it compresses I think a harder wood and certainly if that uh, throat up here was made of horn and some of them are uh, then that wouldn't hopefully happen as much but anyway that's something to be aware of in terms of how tight it is in the sire not very tight at all there is not a very strong grip between the sire and the habaki and that is one of the purposes of a habaki there are several purposes of a habaki in fact um, i've done a video a short video about this on my patreon um, but uh, it part of the reason the habaki is to make a good friction grip between the sire and the sword and I have to say this is pretty loose. It's not a very good grip. And again, I think that's part and parcel of the fact that quite soft wood has been used for the sire and soft wood compresses quickly and loses its grip. They have put a nice um, fitting which matches the uh, Kashira and Fuchi and Suba with the wave theme, um, for the silver wave theme. Um, on the end of the site, which is a, actually a really nice feature and I really like that they've done that because a lot of people will stand their uh, sword up um, against the wall or whatever or they'll you know they're occasionally accidentally maybe even hits the end of the sire um, and having that protection on there actually is a really really nice fitting and I actually wished that more uh, Japanese swords had that obviously it doesn't need to be made of metal it can be made of horn or, or other things but um, I do like that that's there. It's a nice little detail and it gives a nice overall look to the sword. The Sagio um, is, you know, nothing special to write home about. It's just fairly basic uh, black one, nothing interesting. Now, we're going to talk about the blade and its performance and the performance of this as a weapon, which I'm sure many of you are interested in. So many people will buy swords uh, like this, and indeed this particular sword, with the intention of cutting things with it. So we really want uh, a good quality um, steel, we want good heat treatment, we want, you know, hand nice handling characteristics if possible, but we also want an edge that um, is good, that is well sharpened, and hopefully keeps this edge as well. Now. One of the things I have to say uh, that I found about this sword um, fairly early on is I feel like the edge was not really quite finished. So it has got very good edge geometry. Now when I talk about um, edges I always try to um, emphasize the fact that there are two things we're looking for from a good cutting edge material and things like uh, steel type and hardness and stuff like that aside. We're looking for good edge geometry and then we're looking for good edge finish. And those are two different things, okay? You can have something with terrible edge geometry that has a really well applied edge to it, and it will be super sharp and it will cut a piece of paper, but when you cut targets with it, it won't track through the target very well because it doesn't have very good edge geometry. Conversely, you can have a blade that is beautifully made and designed uh, in terms of its edge geometry but it hasn't quite been finished when they came to applying the edge and I kind of feel like this fits into that category. It is a um, pretty much standard um, katana blade with a single bevel edge in theory. In fact this then has a micro bevel added to it so the primary, and I'm going to put my hands on the blade here, so don't, don't freak out, I will oil this blade afterwards. The primary edge bevel is nice and straight, okay? I can't, if I'm going that way, I can't feel any secondary bevel. However, if I look along the edge with a light, as I've got quite bright lights in here, I can see the uh, light shines along the edge, showing me that it has a certain degree of thickness to it. Now there are certain types of uh, ways of sharpening Japanese swords that leave what we would generally call something similar to an apple seed edge, okay, so a convex grind. And that puts a bit more meat behind the final cutting edge and makes it a bit stronger. Nothing wrong with that. 
but where the edges meet, it still has to be super fine. And it doesn't look like this is super fine. And in fact, I'm not applying very much pressure, but you can see I am running my fingers up and down this edge without any problems. Now, <clears throat> if I get a piece of paper here, this isn't running my fingers over isn't always, and funnily enough, skin is actually quite cut resistant, or at least more so than paper is. If I put it against paper, let's see what happens. Nothing, okay? It just glides off. It is not, it has not had the final sharpen applied to it. Now, you might say, well, Matt, why didn't you sharpen it up? Well, because I try and always make a policy on, on my show here, of, on my reviews, of showing how you might get a sword delivered to your door, okay? Not everyone has the equipment or the know-how or the confidence to sharpen a blade to the point where it is really cutting sharp. And as you can quite clearly see, this is not cutting sharp. This is a sword that wasn't quite finished in my view. Now, often when I'm doing reviews, people say to me, Matt, oh, well, people just send you the best example. Um, and I always have to say, well, look, you know, I got this free to review. I get all of the, well, yeah, pretty much all of the swords I get these days, I get free to review, and then I can do with them whatever. I can throw them in the trash bin, I could break them, I could give them to a friend, I could sell them, whatever. So the fact is they're all in the same ballpark to me and there is, no, there is no advantage in me saying that a sword is good if it's crap, okay? Because that would go, that would undermine all of my other reviews, it would under, undermine my business model, it would undermine everything. So you, I, I recognize that you watching my reviews have to trust what I say. Now, there is no purpose in me, uh, given that this was a free sample. And you know, I'd love it if Dynasty Forge sent me some more stuff, but there's no point in me sharpening the sword and pretending that it arrived sharp. It did not, okay? Here is a straight, this is a push cut. It is not sharp. So this is a sword that was made in the factory really nicely, nice, um, if somewhat overly dramatic ham on, I have to say, incidentally, but nice, uh, nice looking blade, looks fantastic. You feel it, you think, my gosh, this is gonna cut like, like an absolute demon with this handling and this extra blade length and the heft in this blade. That is gonna chop like a mother. Uh, and then you find out that it's not really sharp. So I am gonna do a little bit of a test, uh, test cut for you now, um, but bear in mind that this won't cut skin and this won't cut paper. So I have no idea how it's gonna um, go on uh, bottles. I'm gonna do it on bottles and I'm gonna do it on wood. Um, we'll see how it goes. It should do okay on wood because you don't need a particularly sharp edge on wood. You actually need good edge geometry. Uh, and, and other features to the weapon like heft and, and, and you know the inertia and that kind of stuff. Uh, but I suspect it won't do very well on bottles. Let's go and have a look. Start off with some easy milk bottles. So despite not being super sharp, it didn't really have any problem with milk bottles, but then milk bottles are pretty much the easiest target. Let's go for milk bottle again, but with some rising cuts. 
So I've got to say, uh, it's a relatively fine edge. It might not be super sharp, but a relatively fine edge combined with the edge geometry means it cuts pretty well. One thing I'm noticing, uh, as mentioned in the review, the texture or deepness of these castings on the Kashira and on the Suba are creating hot spots on my hands, so something to be aware of. So a slightly tougher target, we're going to look at the Coke bottles now, and bear in mind these have still got the labels on them, and as we've seen in previous videos, the labels can actually uh, provide more of a, a snagging difficulty than uh, you might think. Uh, so let's see how we go with these. They are thicker plastic. Um, no problem getting through, very slightly scooped the cut, but it's fairly straight. There's no tearing, a little bit of deformation there, but there's, there's no tearing, pretty damn clean. It didn't leave the bottle standing, which means maybe that's me, maybe it's the sword, but there's a bit more friction than maybe you'd like. Super sharp, we should leave it standing. Let's see if I can leave one standing and try and get more than one cut out of a Coke bottle because that's obviously the perfect uh, desirable. If this was sharper it would be easier, but let's see. So obviously no problem getting through, uh, but again, even though it's quite a diagonal, quite a downward cut, uh, there is some tearing on the exit wound, as it were, here. There's a little bit of tearing up there. Essentially, just not a very sharp edge, but it does have good inertia, good edge geometry, so no problem getting through, but it would do so much better if it was sharper. Well, a very, very nice clean cut. I got a little bit more uh, momentum into that. Very straight, very clean. Again, uh, knocked it off. Um, so I think it's not, it's pushing. As it's forcing its way through, it's pushing as well because of the lack of fine sharpness on, uh, on the edge there. Um, to finish off with the water bottles, I'm gonna go for a one-handed cut and give some feedback on that. Nice and clean. However, uh, user feedback. I chipped the uh, end of my thumbnail, which obviously is a minor thing, but it's because of, we come back to this texture, this very rough texture on this Suba. It's a real issue. Um, there are a couple of other things that, that have happened as well during the process. The um, Kashira is actually still quite solid. That can come loose, as you know, on many of these reproductions. However, the Fuchi, if you just listen. So the Fuchi is now loose. The Suba is now, it is completely solid still. Um, so the Fuchi is loose and that texture on the Fuchi, the Kashira and the uh, Suba are an issue. You could blame me. Uh, you could say user error, and uh, you'd be entitled to say that if you want. But I have to say, having a, uh, if not Suba, specifically having a Fuchi and a Kashira that have the ability to hurt you is not a good thing. And I personally would say the same with the Suba, at the very least, the underside of the Suba. And really, it doesn't take much at all to catch one of your nails or something like that in there. Um, so there we go. In terms of how the blade is ha standing up, it's still not very sharp. It's no less sharp than previously. 
um, but you know there's no there's no bends or warps or anything like that the edge is perfect there's no uh, no deformation. What we're going to look at now is a slightly tougher target. We're going to look at green wood. Okay, so that uh, that stick behind me there is a freshly cut, or at least a couple of days ago cut, um, holly branch, uh, green wood. We're going to start off with a low cut on it, then we're going to put it back in the ground and successively make it shorter. Uh, so let's see how it goes. As you can see that there was a rising cut number three in Sabre, um, completely smooth. Some of the bark, ah, there was some splitting actually at the side. So completely smooth through there and then tore off a bit further. Let's go for a higher up cut this time. So perfectly clean. Perfectly clean again. little bit of tearing on the way out that time so clean for about three quarters and then the last quarter kind of tore off I'm going to try a rising cut now and completely Completely clean again. I'm gonna, gonna try a couple of freestanding cuts with this resting on top of my cutting stand. Yeah, beautifully clean. You see it transversed a lot further through because it came in at a more shallow angle, uh, but perfectly clean through the wood there. Um, I'm not going to go on any thicker wood for now. Um, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the time to go away and uh, try and hone this blade to be a little bit sharper. Um, clearly on lighter targets, can't cut paper, can cut bottles, but not perfectly, as I suspected on a thicker, um, denser target like wood actually does quite well because it's kind of got an axe like edge doesn't need necessarily that fineness to go through wood uh, but it would go through wood even easier if it was sharper of course so the dynasty forge bushi class silver wave okatana um, what do i think of it well hopefully this review has pretty much summed that up but to, just to just to kind of summarize what i've said here um, i think there are some really good things about this sword and there are some things which need looking at okay the principal thing which i've highlighted i think there are two principal things actually that i've highlighted in, in this review one is the um, edge sharpness which is just not really quite there okay i shouldn't be able to do that on a on a brand new uh, katana blade um, and the second thing is the uh, texture of the cast fittings being somewhat offensive to the user <laughs> they look really really cool i think uh, but they're just not very nice to use and in fact it's damaged my nail it's broken my nail god damn it um so uh, there we go. I think those are the two main takeaways. Do I think this is good value for money? I mean, that's a, a basic question, isn't it? Well, I think last time I looked, this is uh, five or six hundred US dollars. Um, and uh, do I think that that's 
good or bad, I think that's okay actually. It is a nice sword, it is nicely built. The steel uh, of the blade looks very nice, the proportions of the blade are very nice, the handling, I think some people would find this kind of clumpy, but bear in mind it is an Okatana, it, it is what it is, and a lot of antique katanas also feel a bit, you know, like that. Um, they're not necessarily all feel like, uh, you know, light badminton rackets in the hand. There are different types of handling to different swords, so I appreciate that there is one that handles like this. It is fun to cut with. It's got a lot of authority, a lot of power. I am very happy I have it. I think it's really, really nice. I think there are improvements that need to be made. Between you and me, what do I intend to do to this? Well, I actually like the Suka in general. What I don't like are the Suba, the Fuchi, and the Kashira. And so I might look at replacing those, uh, and I certainly will look at sharpening the blade up. Uh, possibly also replacing the Habaki with something that's a little bit more classy. Uh, this is pretty basic, I think, for what it is. Uh, but I do really like the blade. I really like the form of the blade, the size of the blade, the feel of the blade. Um, it's a nice big thing. I love the size of this. It feels like a war sword. It feels like a battle sword. It feels like a big ass uh, kind of 13th century European longsword, frankly. Um, so it, yeah, I really like the way it feels. I just don't like some of the choices in the fixtures and fittings and the finish of that edge. But otherwise, it's a decent sword. I don't think it's at all... Um, bad for that price. If you look at competitors in that kind of five, six hundred dollar uh, range, then there isn't a lot out there for Okatanas and uh, Nodashis or Otashis or whatever, uh, large versions of Japanese sword. And I think Dynasty Forge have made something pretty good here. So go and check out that link below. Um, thanks again to Dynasty Forge for sending this to, to me to, uh, to review. Um, I hope you've regarded this as a pretty impartial view. I think it pretty much has been. I think we now know the positives and the negatives of this particular sword. Um, so uh, I hope that's been useful to you. Once again, I will be coming back with further videos on Japanese swords. Um, I have also got antique Japanese swords to look at. We're going to look at the nomenclature, the, the naming of the different parts, uh, some of the history of Japanese swords, uh, the difference between uh, Tachi and Katana, which I keep promising I'll do, and indeed some reviews of some other Japanese swords uh, coming up as well in the future. So thanks a lot for watching. Um, I've got extra videos on Patreon, three every month. Um, please, if you haven't subscribed, make sure you do click that subscribe button and uh, click the notification bell if you haven't done already. And I'll see you really soon on the channel for another video. Cheers for watching, folks.